both educators and students will find this text very useful. Uh, the authors made it a point to lay out the text across nine chapters, which can then be applied easily to a quarter or semester system. Um, they follow a very inclusive format, so educators will find it very easy to follow this text. Um, also, it has many diverse examples for educators looking to have a more culturally responsive and inclusive classroom. They'll find that in the text. Um, and the text really emphasizes student participation. So teachers who are looking to get students more engaged and have a more participatory classroom will find this text especially useful. Students will also find this text very useful. A lot of the examples and content are relevant. The authors pulled it directly from the headlines to make sure that it was relevant stuff that everyone could relate to, uh, especially our, our student population. And the students are treated like adults within the text. So the text is not talked down to students, it talks with students. So students will feel like they're a part of the learning process when they're using let's agree to disagree. This book is different than other books um, that might be adopted in critical thinking courses. Uh, both, both Nolan and I uh, have taught critical thinking at various institutions over the years, and I've actually written critical thinking or critical reasoning courses across curriculum, particularly in social science, history, and now in communication and critical media literacy. And I think you can tell just by the title of the book, Let's Agree to Disagree, that subtitle, A Critical Thinking Guide to Communication, Conflict Management, and critical media literacy, I think clearly um, lays out from the start that this is an interdisciplinary book. This is a textbook that can be adopted across disciplines that has a focus eventually on media. And it starts out with communication and conflicts, how we mitigate these things. We then get into nuts and bolts about critical thinking itself, right? How to be better critical thinkers. Again, we're very careful that we don't, uh, we're not interested in telling people what to think. We're interested in helping people think independently and critically on their own. And I think that the text is laid out in such a way that we pull various examples from different perspectives across the little ideological spectrum. And I think that that is what invites people in to understand that it's okay to have different ways of seeing the world. It's okay to disagree with people. This kind of a primer, however, really kind of helps people mitigate that or sort of navigate the minefield of daily life. And while we wrote the book, um, thinking about the college courses we teach from community college to the university level, it's something that could definitely be used in upper grades in high school. And even though this is a Taylor Francis Rutledge book, so it's an academic textbook, it's definitely useful and it's written in a way that it could clearly be read by the general pop, you know, the general population, the general public. And in that regard, I do think that that sets the book apart from a lot of other academic textbooks, particularly about critical thinking. This doesn't dive down the deep end of formal logic and these types of things. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but we believe that this book has a real practical application, both inside and out of the classroom for use in the real world. For instructors who are using the text, I think it's really important to start your course by reiterating to students that it's everyone's job in a democracy to be informed and to reach out to others. And so that's why the text is so important. We all have an obligation as citizens in a democracy to be as informed as possible and to have difficult conversations with people, especially those we disagree with. How else can we build consensus? How else can we change minds? Instructors should also model their classroom as a place where discussion is privileged. Uh, I would argue that we should see more discussion um, rather than lecture in a course that uses a text such as let's agree to disagree. Um, this necessitates creating some scaffolding for students, which we have in the text. So having students review and agree to the agreements in the text. The agreements are to use I statements, avoid generalities, speak your truth. These kinds of things that can create a environment that is more conducive to constructive dialogue. Also, students should be encouraged to not only deconstruct arguments, but make arguments as well. Um, they should do this together so they can learn in the process of how to help each other make better arguments and recognize weaker arguments. Teachers should also emphasize the examples in the text as well. We did a job, of, a good job of finding uh, a diverse set of individuals, both in terms of their identity and their ideology, 
and how they've put this text to work. So how folks are modeling this behavior out in the so-called real world. These include celebrities, these include athletes, these include common people. Uh, we highlighted how uh, trans activists use dialogue to try and get people to change their mind from being transphobic. How an African-American man uses dialogue to get people to leave the Ku Klux Klan. Um, how athletes have debated issues of racial justice and use dialogue to convince each other to become allies. These and many more examples are in the text and students will find them as real world examples that takes these concepts from the abstract and makes them something they actually see happening in the real world. For students using this book, um, you know, it is, it is set up like a textbook, but it doesn't always necessarily read or flow like one. So I would encourage students to really familiarize themselves with the table of contents, the index, and especially um, take a look at you know, some of the devices that we use to, to put the book together. If you notice when you're going through the table of contents, we have four parts. The fourth part actually reiterates the term critical, let's get critical. And it then talks about how the many things that we've gone through in the book are things that you want to take with you. So there's no reason to start at chapter one, although we clearly should start somewhere. Um, the conclusion is also a place where students can go to get a clear idea of where are we going on this journey? Where are we going in the book? And why do we think critical thinking is important? Why do we think communication is important? Why do we think critical media literacy is important? And um, I, I think that that's a really useful approach because a lot of times students just start, you know, and they skip the intro, they skip the table of contents, they just jump right in and they start reading whatever they're assigned. And I would encourage students to literally be critical and creative about the way that they use this book overall. Um, I wanted to add one other thing to this that does dovetail, I think, from the last question that Nolan addressed. And that's something that I want to encourage students to engage in. I really want them to practice constructive dialogue. I want them to understand the importance um, of civility. And this means all parties involved engage in acts of reciprocity and critical thinking. This is for the purpose of strengthening our democratic culture. You know, and both of our us, both the authors here, were very aware that civility has long been used as a tool of exclusion. However, in this text, to be civil is to be inclusive, courteous, and considerate where people are, where, where people are at, where are they? Where are they coming from in terms of their knowledge and lived experience? And rather than expect or demand everybody already share the same values, concerns, perspectives, and evidence, citizens need to assess where they are and work from there, including ascertaining how they become who they are now. This takes time and patience, all right? So this is a reminder to the students as teachers as well. It takes resolve to do these kinds of things that have complicated, you know, these kind of complicated and controversial conversations, but they're necessary to mitigate the many differences that exist in multicultural societies. We're also reminded, I wanted to point out, of the words of the now late great Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh, who just passed away not long ago here in 2022, who wrote in The Art of Communicating, when we say something that nourishes us and uplifts the people around us, we're feeding love and compassion. When we speak and act in a way that causes tension and anger, we're nourishing violence and suffering. So how we say things to people is often just as important, maybe more important than what it is we think we're trying to say to them. So a reminder to students, it's fine to disagree. This book just helps us learn how to better do that so that everybody can learn from complicated or controversial situations. We're at an interesting point in, in world history where democracies are suffering from a series of threats, but one in particular is citizens in democracies seem unable or unwilling to communicate with people they disagree with. Um, right in the headlines, we see more and more talk of a coming civil war or huge generalities about millions of people who can't be reached or can't be talked to. Um, big tech tools have made it easier for us to customize our information base and communities to keep out voices and perspectives we don't wanna hear and only allow in those we feel comfortable with. These behaviorisms are simply antithetical to a democracy. And we hope this text gives people the tools to know how to talk to people they disagree with in a constructive way. And this is desperately needed if we're gonna save democracy. 
whoever your political opponent is or ideological opponent is not simply going to disappear over time. You're going to have to have communication with them. You're going to have to face these folks. You're going to have to work with these folks. And this text is helpful in teaching people how they can do that constructively. We're nearly a quarter of the way into the 21st century when we wrote this textbook. And while the world has changed in many ways, certain power dynamics remain. And many see the United States as more divided than any time since its civil war, struggling with seemingly irreconcilable differences domestically and increasingly precarious situations internationally. That said, we wrote this text because not all is lost. There's much we can do in the present to mitigate our differences and transcend tangentious trajectories. Our future living together on this planet with its volatile environment, climatically, as well as socially, politically, and economically, depends on how well we can make logical sense of the world around us, understand each other in truly holistic ways, and even learn how to build bridges, not walls, and work together where we can, even if we agree to disagree. And we all hope that educators, students, anyone reading this book really kind of takes that spirit to heart and models it out in the real world.